Hey, welcome back. We're on week four already of The Power of Three. This summer series is going so fast, isn't it? Last week we were exploring the book of Job. And uh, I, I just have to tell you a joke. I love it when someone with no church background becomes a Christian. A few years ago, a young lady came up to me and said, Pastor, I didn't know there was a whole book of the Bible dedicated to what I do on Monday. I said, what do you mean? I, the Bible cares about that. And she goes, the book of Job. And uh, we just had a good laugh over that. But uh, this book of Job, wow, what an amazing picture of a suffering, righteous person and all the different complexities of that. And I just want to share in this lesson, we're going to look toward the end of the book of Job and look at a psalm that we've been reading and realize that on the other side of hardship, there is hope. You know, when, we are, when we're going through trials, when we're going through undeserved suffering, and I think that's important, just to pause here for a moment. Sometimes we bring stuff on ourselves. You know, if we're just not wise with our time or our money or, or our words, we can bring unnecessary suffering on ourselves. And though God is merciful, sometimes we experience those consequences. But often, godly women and men face suffering that they didn't bring on the, themselves. And that's what the book of Job helps us to get at. How is God working in the midst of unexplainable difficulties. How is God at work? And uh, sometimes God allows affliction and difficulty so that he can work greater humi humility and empathy in our lives. And But I want to spend this lesson talking more about the hope that comes out of suffering. You know, biblical hope is not just waiting for heaven. And by the way, I hope you're looking forward to the return of Jesus. I hope you're looking forward to a forever and uh, if you've never said yes to Jesus fully, uh, the audacity of the Christian faith is that we can have certainty about our eternity. That's Christian hope. And we know that's real because Jesus has risen from the dead and given us a preview of our future. So hope isn't just kind of that long-term future. By the Holy Spirit, God gives us little down payments of that hope in this life. And sometimes our Lord... Uh, gets our attention in unusual ways. Uh, in the case of Job, we're going to see there's a huge revelation of God's power and wisdom. Sometimes God gets our attention with a question. He went to Adam. After Adam and Eve had sinned, he said, Adam, where are you? By the way, God knew their geography, but he wanted Adam <laughs> to respond. He said, Moses, what's in your hand? God knew that Moses had a shepherd's staff, but wanted Moses to respond. He said to the prophet Isaiah, who will go for us in this mission of prophecy and outreach? And of course, Isaiah lifted his hand and said, here I am, Lord, send me. So sometimes God asks questions that help us understand our situation. Now, being back in the book of Job, we're, we're through those cycles of speeches and we're through all of the accusations that were thrown at Job. And we're looking in this lesson at chapters 38 to 41, the revelation of the Lord. And then in chapter 42, the restoration of Job. Along this, we're also looking at Psalm 37. Now, I love Psalm 37 because it's the answer to Psalm 73. And I'm not just playing with numbers, but Psalm 73 the writer is complaining about the unrighteous having a good life while he or she is suffering all the time. And Psalm 37 is the antidote to that. It's this beautiful poem that says, trust in the Lord, do good, wait patiently, God's at work. And by the way, Psalm 37 is also what we call in the Hebrew language an acrostic poem. Every couplet begins with a new letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And that's how God's, God's people would have memorized it and sung it together. And so it's written, its origins go back to the time of David, but it went through lots of editing so that it could become this beautiful song. So in Job 38, as we kind of get started, um, there, God begins with a series of questions and tells Job, hey, get ready. I'm going to really talk to you here, and I want you to brace yourself. I want you to be ready for something you've never seen before. And God's questions declare that the Lord alone is God, and that Job's current view of God is not adequate. You see, Job wasn't punished for particular sins. 
Job went through suffering in order to have a revelation of God. The Lord is revealing the subtle ways that sometimes we create a God of our own. Now, Job is not guilty of idolatry. None of us are worshiping other gods. Um, but sometimes we sort of expect that if we just do the right thing, good things will happen. If we just follow the rules, everything will be fine. And by the way, doing the right thing and following the rules really will bring a better life most of the time. But sometimes, even when we're doing all that we know, there are mysteries and difficulties we endure, and the Lord wants to use those to help us mature in our faith. Now, Psalm 37 shows a pathway of trust while we wait for God to intervene and restore. Notice that every section of Psalm 37 begins with a command and ends with a consequence or a promise. For example, in verses 8 and 9, the writer says, Don't be angry. Don't take revenge. Don't worry. The Lord is working, and the humble will inherit the land. In fact, it's this psalm that is the source of Jesus' great beatitude, the meek will inherit the earth. And by the way, those meek are not weak. Those meek are humble and trusting in God. These passages and other psalms and prophets <clears throat> from Job, from Psalm 37, and other passages inspired the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King and the civil rights leaders of the 1950s and 1960s. They knew something had to change, but they had to go about it in a godly and nonviolent way. They were not passive, but they knew that long-term justice re re required patience and persuasion. And Martin Luther King said one day, I'm not only in favor of African-American folks getting the vote and being equal, I want to see the souls of all Americans transformed and saved, free from racism, free from injustice. Now in Job chapter 40, verses 1 to 9, and in Psalm 37, there's a call to trust in the Lord's justice and choose humility over pride. Though God may not act on our time frame, His will is going to come to pass. And I want to take a moment on this. It's really hard sometimes to wait patiently. Some of us have been praying for family members for decades. I have. I have natural brothers and stepbrothers and others that really need to meet Jesus. And I pray for them. And it's frustrating that I, have, that I haven't seen as, much, uh, as many results as I'd like. Sometimes, uh, sometimes, Hebrews 11 tells us that our patience awaits an eternal answer. And so the challenge to us today is, will we trust the Lord and do what's right and worship Him in spirit and truth even while we wait for the answers to our longings and to our prayers? Now, here's what's really wonderful. As Job receives this revelation, I mean, and the, the, this poetry is amazing. God's saying, look, I put the stars in place. I put the deep sea monsters in place. I'm in control of it all. Job, will you trust me? And Job finally says, you know what? I repent. I humble myself. The beginning verses of chapter 42. Uh, I, have, I, I didn't realize how much I still had to learn. You see, Job wasn't guilty of a particular sin. Job was given an expanded revelation through his sufferings. And then God restored Job and granted him a family again, granted him prosperity. And I think it's important that we realize that restoration ultimately comes in eternity, but God loves to restore and heal in this life as well. Sometimes we hear phrases like, I'm waiting on God's timing, have patience, trust and obey, surrender to the Lord's will. They're all good, but they can almost feel hollow when we're going through such difficulty. Uh, there was a great missionary named David Brainerd, missionary to the Native Americans. He kept a diary of his prayers and his longings, his preaching, his heart before God. And his missionary adventures lasted less than two years. He brought the gospel to a tribe that received it, and he died before the age of 33. And yet his legacy of faith lives on. And I think we have many stories like this. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great uh, German theologian and pastor who opposed Hitler, 
just before the war ended, he was executed for his, pl- part, of his part in the plot to get, to get rid of Hitler. And yet his legacy lives on. We need to trust the Lord in the midst of every circumstance we find ourselves in. And what the Lord's doing in our difficulties is working a trust and a faith and a patience and a love that will help us empathize with others and help us grow in our maturity. So today, let's trust Him in the midst of our challenges and let's also know that He's working character and working transformation as we follow Him.